So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Father Bruce John Hamilton and my assistant, uh, Father Richard Conlin here at Corpus Christi. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome Father Fred Dolan to our Corpus Christi show. So welcome, Father. Thank you very much, Father BJ. And uh, I'll just begin with a prayer and then we'll launch right into this episode. We're really looking forward to having you here. That's great. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of this day, and we thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, bestowed upon your people, bestowed upon us as your priests. We ask now that you bless this conversation, help many people will benefit from it and be drawn closer to Jesus, the heart of Jesus, your son, our blessed mother and Saint Joseph, our Father and Lord. And we ask that you bless Father Fred and all his work as a priest of the Prelature of Opus Dei. And we ask now that you be with us during this time. Our guardian angels pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you once again, Father, for being with us. We're really looking forward to this. Um, I thought it'd be just great to have you introduce yourself to our audience. Um, tell them a bit about Father Fred Dolan. Great, I'll take it over. That's Thank you very much, Father BJ. Well, I am uh, very pleased to be here with you today, obviously. I've been in Canada since uh, the end of January, 1998. I grew up in, in Bethesda, Maryland, which is right over the, the border from Washington, DC. So I lived in Bethesda until the end of high school. Interestingly, I went to high school just down in Washington, just a few blocks from the Capitol building, then spent, went to undergraduate in New York City, then worked for a couple of years out in California, in Oakland, California, back to Boston for, to study business, then a stint as a stockbroker in Stamford, Connecticut, one year with a publishing house in New York City, and then I ended up going to Rome in September of 1980 to study philosophy and theology. And in 1983, I was ordained a priest of the Prelature of Opus Dei in Rome. And after that, different places, six months in Madrid, six months in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and then a stint out in South Bend, Indiana, four years in New Rochelle, New York at Opus Dei's US headquarters, back out to South Bend for a year, just right down the road from Notre Dame University. Then I was asked to go to Rome in 1992 to work at the Opus Dei's headquarters with the prelate back at that moment who was Alvaro del Portillo, now blessed Alvaro. So I did that until the, until the end of uh, 1997. Then I packed my bags and moved to Montreal, January 31st, 1998, in order to be the, the, the regional vicar of Opus Dei for Canada. So that went on until just a number of months ago. And now I'm, my title is the secretary vicar of Opus Dei. And as you can easily imagine, because this is such a wonderful country, uh, I hope I spend the rest of my days here. Mm -hmm. So there's my little thumbnail sketch. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, you uh, had to, you, you did get to know uh, Jose Maria Escriva, now Saint Jose Maria Escriva. Um, I was wondering if you could, for, our, for the people who are watching this, you could probably talk for hours just on uh, Saint Jose Maria, but one thing that really stands out to you about this man who is now a canonized saint. I mean, we this is you're the first person we've ever talked to, and hopefully not the last, but who is actually known somebody who's now canonized by the church. You know, it's interesting you say that because in you know I've uh, had the, the great honored of, I, 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 I saw St. Jose Maria in, in 1970, 
Then I was ordained by St. John Paul II, and I had the chance to, wow. to meet uh, Mother Teresa. Wow. So it's a little, little bit overwhelming, as you can imagine. But in the, to answer your question, you know, St. Josemaria just get, transmitted such tremendous meaning to the things we do every day. I can remember my very first time going to a center of Opus Dei as a high school junior, third year in high school, and just being quite struck at the, the whole notion of giving to our work much deeper meaning. A tip for a typical high school student, you just get your homework done as soon as you can and then go and do fun things. But from the very beginning, first time I set foot in that center in Washington, the atmosphere, the, the whole insistence was, wait a minute, this is your professional work. And for the rest of your life, you can take that work that you're doing and turn it, transform it into something magnificent. And therefore, and thereby, give to that work, that hour of work, great, great transcendence. And that in, in itself is, well, it's just enormously satisfying. And furthermore, it's true, it's real. It's not just a technique. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that, that hope um, that that could be possible for them. Like, I know for myself, when I was working before I went to seminary, the idea was like, get some prayer in the morning, work eight to 10 hours, get some prayer in the evening, and not really having much of an experience of how those, that work time could actually somehow be involved with God. So for those who have never really experienced what it's like to this idea of sanctify work or, or bring God into work, uh, what does that look like on a practical level to to do such a thing? Well, that's a great question. On a practical level, what it means is developing more and more an awareness that we are in God's presence wherever we are. And because of that, if we want to, we can turn to the Lord before, during, and after we're, we're working, whatever we're doing, we're filling the, the car with gas. And we can say to the Lord, I hereby turn this into a gift to you. And one of the great results of that is we then become that much more aware. I have to do a, a fantastic job. I can't give the Lord just any old crummy piece of work. This has to be the very best I can. And if I may, I'll tell you a quick anecdote about one of my heroes here in Montreal that I met not that many years ago. There was somebody inviting me to a a golf tournament to raise money for a local hospital. So I went, played golf, afterwards went to the locker room, and the only person in the locker room was the locker room attendant, 65-year-old uh, Francophone Quebecois gentleman. And I was dressed as a golfer, obviously. I walked into the room and he looked at me, he said, you had a wonderful round of golf, it was a gift of the Lord. So I was surprised at that. I said, well, thank you very much. You're, you're absolutely right. Well, then he disappeared. I changed and 20 minutes later, he came around the corner. By then I was dressed in my clericals and he, he was surprised. He said, oh, father, I had no idea. We were still alone. And so he then proceeded to explain to me his approach, his attitude. He said to me, Every time anyone walks in that door, I say a prayer for him. Hmm. Then that person puts at the foot of the locker his shoes, his golf shoes. So I take them, I make them look, as, I do a fantastic job, make them look like new, put them back at the foot of his, his locker. And I say, okay, Jesus, you take these shoes and whoever puts his feet in them and lead them back to you. And I just stared at this gentleman and I said, sir, hats off to you. Because it's a very boring job to be all day in the little locker room. And you can imagine not only the job he did, but the atmosphere that he created around him. The atmosphere of, of, of joy, of, 
of satisfaction among all those who had their shoes shined. We can do that with anything we do. Mm. Making a bologna sandwich. I'm not sure why that comes to mind now, but it does. We can turn that into something really wonderful. Mm. And that was one of the one of the basic points of St. Jose Maria's preaching. He said, by doing that day after day, our life can turn into something magnificent, if not canonizable, mm. which is what we're, we're, what we're aiming for. Mm. So is it too much to say, because uh, that it almost sounds like life takes on the reality of an adventure. It's no longer a horizontal reality. And what I mean by horizontal for our listeners is something that's just lived in this world, get up, do your thing, go to bed, get up, do your thing. But it's like an adventure. Um, I'm going to bring this up in my, my homily this weekend about how Gandalf has to drag Bilbo Baggins out of his hobbit hole and he's resisting at first because he's so comfortable but then when he's out of his hobbit hole he goes on the adventure of his life and it sounds like this makes our life takes it into the realm I know it's the supernatural but I want to use the word adventure um, and I just wonder if you could just sort of comment on um, you know, what you've said and how it really does become an adventure and it's not just the humdrum activities of every day. I can't remember the exact saying of St. Jose Maria, but he said, I believe it was, you can take um, the, the verse of each day, you, you probably remember it better than I do. And uh, if you could sort of uh, build on that, please. One of the things he said in his book, The Way, is that many people see life in just two dimensions. And along with our life of faith comes the third dimension with depth and along with it, tremendous other, all sorts of, of harmony, vibration, music, romance, you could say. And in the homily, the, the homily that you're talking about, he gave that in 1967 and said that uh, that the earth and the sky seem to meet in the horizon, but where they really meet is in your heart when you find ways of transforming everything you're doing into a prayer. What it looks like is someone who has discovered much, much greater meaning in the things of every day. And let's face it, as the, as the weeks and months and years go by, Unless people find that, that romance, that adventure, life can become boring, it can become a real drudgery. But who wants to be a drudge? Whereas if we, if we take that, that typical approach, the typical day of ours and inject it with this deeper meaning, well, suddenly we're doing great things. Now, I, I like, to, for some reason, I think of uh, someone who's doing manual labor. That person, you, ask, you could ask that person, what are you doing? And that person could say, well, I'm laying bricks. You ask the sa same person after they have discovered the, the romance, the adventure of doing things for God. And you can say, well, I'm building a cathedral. I'm doing something really great. I'm transforming many lives through laying bricks. It's a whole different thing, a whole different layer of meaning that we give to the things we're doing. I love that. It's, it's almost um, like developing somewhat of a childlike attitude of, of faith in which you, you're seeing extraordinary and just the ordinary. And you're, there's this aspect of like creativity in which we, when you go back to the, the locker room attendant, like he was able to find this aspect of just the shoes and how the shoes in itself were somehow, you know, leading people to Jesus. And so there yeah. really is this kind of childlike creativity in which you're taking the things of your day and, and finding some connection to faith. Um, kind of building upon that, how about say just the the mother with um so a couple of young children what would 
would it look like for the young mother to sanctify her ordinary um, duties as a, as a mother? Very important question. If a mother can have this vision of creating a new civilization, I know those are big words, I know, but still. You know, I, it makes me think of my own mother. I'm the oldest of six. And uh, myself and my siblings, we grew up with uh, tremendous love for music, for culture, a lot of stories. One day, one of my sisters, when she was herself was a young mother, was visiting home and she sat down with, with mom, with our mother, with a yellow pad in her hand and she said, okay, mom, I want you to tell me how you went about giving us this so much culture. My mother stared at her and said, what? She, had, she, couldn't, she couldn't speak. She said, I don't know. Which gets at a very important point. Those things are done through these tiny interactions one day after another over a span of a lifetime. It's, I think we have to get that across to the dads too. You say to a father, you take one of your younger children with you to the hardware store. Maybe it's just once, but 30 years from now, that one adventure will loom really large in the mind of that, that child of yours. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can get, get parents to see the marvels of what they're doing one day at a time well then they can put that much more of an effort much more thought into it taking much more time to think what does this child of mine need how can i spend time with with a meaningful conversation how can i pass along stories about our family our past without thought that doesn't happen and if I may, I could just expand on that one for very briefly. I was fascinated with an article talking about two different types of people. One, one group, when things get tough, they're very resilient. The other group, they just, they crash. They, they're not resilient at all. The researchers said, okay, let's, Let's track down what, it, what made the difference. And the difference is telling stories. In the first group, they grew up hearing all about what their parents, their grandparents went through during the Great Depression. You know, all sorts of stories. They knew everything about their ancestors. So that when things got bad, they could think, yeah, but my grandmother in 1930 she had nothing in the midst of the Great Depression. The other group, they didn't even know where their parents grew up. They didn't know any stories. And so when things got bad, when they couldn't find a parking space, for example, they would just lose it. It's a very trite example, but it doesn't take much for someone to lose it if they have not been given those stories that build up this base of this base of resilience, of personality. Um, wow, well, that's... Uh, Father Richard mentioned about, um, you know, a mother with two children, and you started talking about how uh, important it is for fathers, you know, to do little things, like we, the example you mentioned is taking your child, one of your children, maybe one time to a hardware store. But I think right now, I think, I, I believe it's accurate to say we have a crisis of fatherhood and, and I, at least in Western society, Europe, North America, probably South America as well. And I uh, remember years ago, I've never been able to find this article, but Scott Hahn referring to a, a talk that the then Archbishop Ratzinger gave about the crisis of fatherhood. And I was wondering if you could just speak into and maybe build a little bit about uh, this, this, this crisis of fatherhood, or how, and how can fathers, because men, 
uh, today, fathers particularly, are really dumped on. They're, they're sort of, they're not portrayed very well, and they really need lifting up, building up encouragement to be good men, good fathers, good men of God. So. Big topic. Well, there really are no shortcuts. I mean, it really comes down to being, becoming, working at becoming men of faith. Men who, who think, who read, who put everything down in order to spend time with, with their family. Men who, when they're about to walk into the house, they stop and they think, wait a minute, this, this is where it counts. There's a, a, an author I appreciate very much by the name of Jim Stenson, a great educator. And in a talk he gave to dads, he said to them, you know, you have to realize on the one hand, that report that you put so much time into at work, after a week or so, it will be shredded. This is, this is back a few years, but that time you spend with your children will last forever. So think about it. And he's really right. You know, I think the, the, the dads, they have to develop a prayer life. They have to be thinking, how can I, how can I show my children my love for God, my love for the mass, my appreciation for everything that's being done at home. And just the, the way that a dad will thank people in the house for what they've done, then people will never forget that. You know, I, I, I have a couple, I, have my, I had a wonderful father. He went to mass every day as long as I knew him. I'll never forget the day that uh, it was a hot, typical August day in Washington, DC, really humid, really oppressive. And the, the gentlemen, the, the men outside collecting the garbage going down the street were out there. It was, for them, it must have been unbearable. My dad went out with them and he, I can still picture him. He, he said, uh, can I offer you a bud? Budweiser, mm -hmm. nice cold bud. And they lit up and they were in seventh heaven. Yeah, that kind of thing is very typical. And here I am, I don't know how many years ago, that what, 50 years ago, uh, thinking about it. I think another very much, very important is the mass. Now, it's one thing, uh, it's, it's not enough for the, the dad to say, okay, we're going to be late. Everyone get in the car. Let's go. You got to go to mass. Otherwise, there will be trouble. The children have to see that the father loves the mass. And I, I just, I can't resist giving one more anecdote from my own, my own childhood. It was a, a mass, mass was over. I think we were just about the only ones left, my father and I. He was there in the pew with his head in his hands. And I must've been six. So I remember thinking, gee, I wonder what's wrong. So I, I kind of tapped him on his, I said, dad, is there anything wrong? He looked up, he said, no, no, I'm just talking to Jesus. And I remember thinking, now that is cool. That is amazing. And here I am, <laughs> just, that was, it's a long time ago. Mm. And, and one more point about the importance of the mass, very mm. interesting study, again, taking a look at two different groups. The, the main question was, how important it, is it to take the kids to mass? And the researchers found, on the one hand, if the mother took the, kid, the children to mass, the father never went to mass. Even if the mother takes the children every day, when those kids hit around 12 years old, 
they stop going to mass because of the example of their father. Something happens at the age of 12. The importance of the example of the father suddenly becomes paramount. On the, on, on the other hand, you take the case in which the mother doesn't go to the church, the dad got, does go to mass. When those kids hit 12, 13, 14, they continue going to mass because of the example of their father. Wow. So I think we have to reinforce to the dads, they cannot imagine how much their strength means to their children and to their spouse. Wow. So, um, I was reading John Maxwell's book, 21 Laws of Leadership, and, and that last law is about, I think it's called the law of legacy. And it's like, what is the legacy that you want to leave for others? And uh, it's, it's really edifying just to hear about the legacy that your father uh, has, has left for you and, and what's been impressionable. And so it's, it's always uh, encouraging or, yeah, it's good for us to reflect upon like what are, what are the ways that we want to be remembered from those um, that we care for, those that we want to leave an impact for. So, yeah, thank you for sharing the stories about your father. It's, it's always so... Uh, good to hear when you have um, a father who's who's yeah left such a good impact upon you because we know that that we uh, that the father is supposed to reveal God to us in so many ways so it's appropriate too in this year of Saint Joseph that he's um, he's really a role model for fathers do you have any advice for people out there that want to get closer to St. Joseph, anything stand out for you in this year of the role of St. Joseph and everything we've been speaking about? I think it's very important that everyone read this very short letter of the Pope from December 8th last year on St. Joseph. It's a very short letter, very powerful, because it helps us to appreciate what Joseph must have gone through with all these mysterious things happening, not, not understanding, but continuing uh, hope against hope with tremendous trust. And that trust in a life of faith did not spare him difficulties. He was incredibly resilient. And one of the phrases I love from that letter is creative courage. Because Joseph had in some of his situations, if we try to fill in the gaps, we realized this is really tough. I mean, just the flight into Egypt to go to a different country, knowing that the ruler of, of, the, of your own homeland wants to kill your child, getting there, not knowing how you're going to make a living, not speaking the language, not knowing anybody. Those are things we can't imagine. But Joseph, with that creative courage of his, he made it happen, to use the current phrase. He just made it happen. So I think anything we can do to, to read and meditate on that letter can lead to a lot of great resolutions for each one of us. Undoubtedly, Joseph was a man of prayer. Uh, creative courage just doesn't come out of thin air. And you have talked about prayer. And uh, I suspect that not everybody, but many people we're hoping lots of people who watch this, uh, perhaps, you know, they wonder about prayer. How can I pray? A lot of people struggle with prayer. Um, I know it's a huge topic, but I wonder if you could just give a couple of key points for people to try and uh, get a prayer life going, kickstart some prayer, you know, that conversation with God that's absolutely foundational for our relationship with him and, and our outlook on life. I think for starters, it's useful to have something at hand that you can look at to give you ideas for your conversation with the Lord. One uh, app that I find really useful is called I Pray with the Gospel. It is, it, it's a collection of what's well, a reading for each day of the year, a very short reading that always contains a really interesting anecdote. It starts off with the gospel of the day and then it leads into the anecdote. For example, today's I found really interesting. 
where the gospel talks about Jesus saying, I have, cho I have chosen you. And the anecdote has to do with some words of Pope Emeritus Benedict, I believe in Birmingham, where he says, I have chosen you. Well, he, he, he comments on that saying, the Lord has chosen each one of us for something very specific that only we are able to do. Well, that is food for thought because and then it leads us to think, okay, Lord, that means that you're, you are counting on me to do something. And if I, if I follow through and listen to you and ask you on a daily basis, what do you want from me today? Great things are going to happen from that. And my life is going to have an impact on other people. So that just a little thing like that can open up all sorts of horizons and open, open up, as you were saying earlier, a real sense of adventure of what our life is all about. So that's one thing. I, I pray with the gospel. And if anyone can't find it, they can contact you, Father, Father BJ. You can tell them. There's also, I find really helpful, a, uh, another app called, well, it's basically, it's relevant radio. Hmm. There's a radio station out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. And among the many things they have on that app, you can also listen to them. But I, I look at it every day because they have a reading of that day's uh, in conversation with God. This is a 15 minutes worth, but it can also help to be exposed to different insights of the great saints, the fathers of the church. And those two can open up all sorts of horizons. There are other, other times when we just set a time, we set aside time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes and just say to the Lord, today I don't need to listen or read anything. You and I have a lot to talk about because I'm bewildered, I'm upset, I'm anxious. Uh, I just want to get closer to you. And then that can be a great prayer because then we have the chance to just talk things over with him to find out, okay, what is at the bottom of this little bit of uneasy, uneasiness of mine? Maybe by the end of that time of prayer, we will have learned that much more about us, about ourselves. Maybe we'll learn that we were being far too self-centered or way too sensitive, things like that. A lot of different, you're right, it's a huge topic, but those are just a couple of, of quick ideas. That's a good, good tip. It's like always have something to bring to prayer, either in your own life or if there's nothing um, really moving in your own life that, that's uh, inspiring you to, to talk to the Lord about it lots of good resources. But yeah, using the daily gospel as, as somewhat of a launching point upon which you can start that conversation is, is always a trustworthy um, place to begin. So, you know, I think uh, it's very important to have a set, of, uh, have a set time to spend in, in prayer, contemplation, meditation, whatever you want to call it. Because if we don't have a set time the chances are we might end up saying, well, I'll just, I'll spend 15 minutes before I go to sleep. Well, that's like eating one potato chip. It's just not going to happen. Of course, if you have a set time and we know that, okay, that time is set aside for the Lord and I'm, I will be unreachable except by him. Well, then it will happen. And, you know, we have to keep in mind that great advice of St. Teresa of Avila, 16th century, who said that the one thing the devil will do, will do whatever he can, is to dissuade us from praying. Because if he knows that we are going to pray every day, well, he is toast. It's a very loose translation, but he loses and we win. And I've heard you a number of times mention that when you're in prayer to, to us priests, but I imagine you say to the... Uh, members of the lay faithful as well, that when you're in, especially these days, you may not be able to get on a plane, but you can use your airplane mode. 
That is of un unbelievable importance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable because only when we really and truly disconnect can we really and truly start to concentrate. Because otherwise, we might have a 10 second spurt of thought until something vibrates or whatever. We, 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 we can end up getting into the habit of distraction and then we don't get anywhere. And we, we, we shortchange our brain, our poor brain at a certain moment loses the capacity to concentrate. And once that happens, all bets are off. Then we, 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 can't, we really can't get anywhere. Yeah, I like the uh, the image of the airplane mode because it's like prayers, like a lifting of your mind and heart to God. So there's somewhat of that. It's a little visual to uh, remind us of what we're actually trying to do. Um, That's right. How about, how about for like the the mothers that are like, oh, it would be nice to have some peace and quiet, <laughs> but they just can't get away. Um, is it part of that creative courage of like collaborating with the husband to find? opportunities to get away or, or what are some of like the the tips that you have for people that feel like it's it's pretty hard to find some quiet time for prayer well i think it depends on the age group of the kids at home but uh for the moms who are at home with young children yeah, at a certain point they can the, the mom can say to the ones who are old enough to say Okay, so let's make a deal. We're, you and I, we're going to spend time talking to Jesus. So let's start right now, and I'm going to read something, and then you and I think about it. And the little one, if, if he or she is old enough, they'll say, oh, okay, great. A, a cute story that you may have heard. One young mom did this and picked up this little book by St. Josemaria, his first book, all the way. And the point she read was, the day that you and I get up from the dinner table without having made some kind of a sacrifice mm -hmm. is the day we will have eaten like a pagan. So then the mom looked at her son and said, okay, so let's think about that. So after about 10 seconds, the little one looked up and said, what's a sacrifice? So the mom explained it. Okay, okay. Then after another 10 seconds, what's a pagan? And she explained it and then he looked and he was very deep in thought. He said, mom, I just realized I've been a pagan all my life. <laughs> so that's one technique. I think another one is just to, it's a great idea to, to get the older kids to watch the younger ones while the mom disappears. This, this is for the, the one, moms who are at home, staying at home. And another one is just to reassure the moms with real young kids that the Lord is tickled pink to see your efforts, even if chaos is happening all around you. Mm -hmm. One of the stories I, I love is from a, someone who <clears throat> years and years ago had young ones. And the, one day she just in spiritual direction she said to the priest, my, my house is a mess. My kids are a mess. Everything's a mess. It's a mess. And the priest, that very wise priest, died a few years ago. He said, Anne, never forget. Our Lord's passion and death was a mess. Very bloody, very noisy, very chaotic. But it brought us salvation. So relax. And she realized what he was saying to her was, okay, right now, your vocation is to be a mess. <laughs> so hang in there. It won't last forever. Yeah. That's really profound, actually. Yeah. That's very profound. That's very yeah. deep. Because many, even as a priest, I mean, I don't want to take it away from the mothers with small infants, but sometimes we can feel our life is a mess sometimes. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you've spoken, um, Father Fred, because I've heard you give a number of, of talks on the importance of, it's sort of, it is dealing with the topics we've discussed, 
maybe it's on the periphery, but it also will feed into the center. And that is distraction and concentrated uh, work, uh, whether it's prayer or particularly prayer, but not just prayer, just the work you're doing. So many people fight with distractions. We touched upon it with the airplane mode in, prayer, in, uh, in, in our prayer meditation. But can you sort of speak to that a little bit? Because I, I just know, I, you know, with being a confessor, so many people are really plagued by distractions. Well, this, I think, is one of the biggest challenges of our day. Because unless, so many people think that we're supposed to be distracted now. We're supposed to be available and reachable at all times which is a recipe for going nuts. And for younger ones, for student, people of student age, well, it's also a recipe for just not retaining all that much. There's a book I appreciate a great deal, which is called Deep Work by a professor of computer and computer science at Georgetown by the name of Cal Newport. It's a very short book. I think it's a very important book written just a few years ago because his whole point is unless we learn how to turn off distraction and really focus and concentrate, we will lose the capacity to concentrate and to focus and we will lose the capacity to access certain parts of our brain where we think deeper and where we synthesize, we do all sorts of things that don't happen if we don't focus. And so he, he, he really puts his finger in the wound. He says, if, if we spend enough time in a state of frenetic shallowness, we end up permanent, permanently reducing our capacity to do deep work. With students, what they end up doing with it, the big risk is they, they retain little, they end up frazzled, they end up not finishing their work because they're spending so much time doing all sorts of things that are really not essential. And then their university years and high school years are finished. And they, they, they've They've, they haven't read, they haven't read, period. They, that's, that's a, I'm seeing that now more and more. They just don't read. And all sorts of bad things come from that. You know, there's a, a thinker by the name of Serti Yange. We, 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 we English speakers, it was Serti Lange, <laughs> writing almost 100 years ago. He wrote a very important book called The Intellectual Life where he talks about the importance of, of focusing. And the image he uses is one of converging ray, rays. He says, let your mind become a lens thanks to the converging rays of attention. You know, focus on what you should be focusing on and then let your whole brain just be absorbed by that one thing. And, and he says, learning requires intense concentration. Now, those who are listening, who, who want to find out more about this kind of thing, there's a very important program called Optimal Work. If you just Google Optimal Work, you'll come across this. It's, uh, it's really a program, an approach to studying, to working, developed by a, a psychiatrist in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, works at Harvard Medical School. He has been mentoring Harvard and MIT students for a number of years. And what he has discovered is these are very bright people who have not been shown how to work without any distraction for one hour. And so he, the whole point of his of his tutoring, his mentoring, has been to show them to the extent that you can turn off all notifications, no distractions, 
and for one hour, just really, really, really focus, you won't believe how much you get done. And then you take a 10 minute break and do it again. And by five, five o'clock, you have finished all your classwork. You have time to be with your friends, sports. You have much more time and you remember things and you do much, you're, the quality that you put out is a much greater, much greater quality. Yeah, that's, I mean, you're speaking right into the, one of the, the biggest challenges of our culture today, just this constant distraction. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's first good just to name, to name that challenge and to provide some resources. Um, yeah, I know that for us, like prayer has to be considered, you know, the deepest work. Um, apart from Okay, so apart from just like turning off all exterior distractions, how about the interior when people, uh, you know, constantly get plagued by thinking about other things in prayer or just all these other things keep popping up in the interior world that we have? Um, what's your advice for people that struggle with the interior distractions? I think part of it is asking the Holy Spirit to give us prayer. If a distraction comes to mind, I think it's, it's good to just uh, to get rid of it. Say, okay, some, sometime, some other time. Sometimes the distraction can be all of a sudden you remember something that you forgot to do or that you want to do. And for that, it's useful to have a, a, a notebook or something hand, handy where you can just jot it down really quickly without turning on airplane mode, turning off airplane mode in order to look up and take care of it. No, just jot it down real quick, but then move on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think each one of us can get better and better at, at distinguishing those distractions that the Lord wants us to think about and process versus those that are just plain old distractions. Mm -hmm. And the ones we should process, well, that, that can become a, a subject for our prayer. But a lot of them, I think it's, it brings up the whole topic of what, what is called internal mortification. In other words, gaining control over our imagination and our memory and our curiosity because it's, it's important. It's important that we be in control. St. Teresa of Avila, I referred to her earlier. She referred to the imagination as the, the crazy lady of the house, the loca de la casa. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, our imagination is a wonderful thing, but if we let it take over, we can, we can, we can, we can go crazy. The same for the memory. We have, to, we have to be in control. And that takes developing really habits of, of control, of concentration. With the time that we have left, talk about somebody else that you knew really well who is blessed now. And the reason I want to talk a little about Blessed Don Alvaro is because not only he's a personal friend of mine, a spiritual friend of mine, but I've adopted him and we've adopted him. Well, I, I guess the parish in my, I have in the, you know, as a pastor here at Corpus Christi, I've made him the patron saint of our uh, new school, a capital campaign uh, for our new school and parish center and daycare. And the reason I did that was because Don Alvaro, as I keep saying to people, was the money man for our father, for the, for the prelate of Opus Dei, for the founder of Opus Dei, St. Jose Maria. Uh, St. Jose Maria relied upon him so much because he was such a faithful steward. He actually called, I'll let you uh, tell the people what he called Don Alvaro. So if you could just speak to Don Alvaro and give the people a little bit of uh, this great man who um, sort of led Opus Dei after the death of St. Jose Maria, uh, it would be just wonderful. Well, you know, it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about the, about the dads. 
Don Alvaro was referred to by St. Jose Maria as the rock. And this goes back to when, this is the, when back in the 1930s, we're talking when Don, Don Alvaro del Portillo was all of 21, 22 years old. And St. Jose Maria was 35, 36, 37. So here you have these two men, in the case, especially in the case of St. Jose Maria, in the midst of civil war, in the midst of terrible obstacles, he, he could not take his eyes off what he saw was what was God's plan for him. At his side was this, this young engineering student, Alvaro del Portillo. And very early on, St. Jose Maria saw that, that Alvaro, he had the so many different qualities that gave him such strength, loyalty, strength of will, love of God, sense of mission, I mean, a whole string of things that made him a great saint. And so the two of them worked together from 1935 until St. Rosemaria's death in 1975. And then Don Alvaro took over until his death in 1994 until 1994, and he really was a rock, which makes me thinking of all the dads, all the dads everywhere, they have to have this firmness, this solidity of, of a patriarch, something we can really pray for, for all, all of our dads. So I know he also raised a lot of, he had to raise money. I mean, money had to be raised. Could you speak into a bit of that? Because that's one of the ways in which I'm sort of hoping people will learn more. Obviously, it's not about the money per se, but his incredible faith. And he had to do all the human work as well. But uh, his incredible faith in raising money that was seemingly an insurmountable task on a human level. Well, we're talking to the above all in the 1950s, so just after World War II, when it, it be, there was a big project to create Opus Dei's central house in Rome. And uh, St. Josemaria relied on Don Alvaro to <clears throat> raise the money, <clears throat> excuse me, for the, to pay the workers on a weekly basis. So this went on for, for 10 years, something that's really hard to imagine. And there was a moment when Don Alvaro was in bed with a fever. And the founder came to him and said, Alvaro, my son, yeah, I really, really hate to ask you this, but we have the payrolls due, the men re re rely on this money. So can you get out of your sick bed and go raise some money? And he did without a, hesit without a moment's hesitation. So he had this great sense that uh, what needed to be done was done. And furthermore, he had, he had learned from St. Josemaria, in spite of the odds, the apparent odds, if this is something that God wants, it will happen. And there are many stories in during that those years where they, they had no idea where they were going, going to get the money for the to pay the next payroll that was due. But they found it somehow. So a lot of it is just a matter of faith and realizing, you know, we're not doing this for ourselves, we're doing this for future generations. And this, I can, Don Alvaro told us so many times, talking about our own efforts, he said, when you ask for money, don't be surprised if you get the door slammed in your face. And that's just gonna happen. But that cannot slow us down because we are doing God's work. And furthermore, if we do a good job of explaining what we're up to, people will realize that we're doing them a great favor by giving them the opportunity to collaborate in something that is going to have an impact 
on many people down through the generations, which is what you're doing there at Corpus Christi. Oh, you know, yes. Just a couple of months ago, I was out there and saw the new school that will, will be opening in the fall. And well, that in itself, it says it all because who knows the future prime minister of Canada, the future great, great people of all different backgrounds and all different jobs are gonna be the beneficiaries. They're gonna be the fruit of, of that beautiful school. Yeah, for me, we're seeding, that's the way I look at it, good education. And I believe our people here really strive to give a good education. Um, it's not just doing one's job, it's it's seeding a country. Yeah, oh yeah. With young men and women and his father, Father Richard and I, um, while we're together here to do our best job to let these kids know that uh, it's their faith that will feed everything and will give them, they give their whole life a, a true supernatural outlook. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Yeah, I've really, it seems like a kind of consistent theme throughout this uh, conversation with you, Father Fred, is just that supernatural outlook upon everything that happens. And I guess it's very fitting that, that you know, that just the title Opus Dei, the work of God, is what all of us are called to do. Um, how about taking that supernatural outlook for today, those that are still struggling in this time of COVID, do you have a, a message of faith for how people can take that supernatural outlook during these difficult times? Well, you know, I've had, in, during this past year, I've had very much in mind the an episode in the life of St. Jose Maria, because when he was, 34 years old, living in Madrid, and Opus Dei had maybe a dozen people worldwide. The civil war broke out in Spain. And very quickly, like within days, he found himself hiding for his life. If he had shown up, uh, he walked out on the street, he, he would have been shot on sight. So the Starting in 1937, he and I believe four or maybe five others sought refuge in the consulate of Honduras in Madrid. So they ended up in this very small room, they going from day to day, not having any idea how long they would be there. And the, the whole building was, had nearly 100 people packed in there, hiding basically. So his approach, being a man of faith, was, okay, each day we're here is one more installment of our sanctity. So let's make the most of it. So he established a schedule. They had a schedule for their prayer life. He preached to them each morning, often in a whisper so they wouldn't be found. They had a schedule for working, for studying, a very developed schedule. They did that for five months, barely, hardly, hardly leaving that room. That's, we will never ever, God willing, have a, any circumstances like that. But I think about that and think of his resilience and think we have to have the same thing. We have to bring him to our day order we have to find ways of using our time well. And we have to have creative courage. We have to find ways of communicating in new ways. The, the whole thing of Zoom, of YouTube videos, getting the word out in different new ways is really quite fascinating. Staying in touch with friends. I just tell you one quick vignette was that when I worked for two years as a stockbroker and from 77, 1977 to 79. And every five years or so since then, I've thought about a guy that I appreciated very much. <clears throat> I've tried over the years to track him down, never been able to. And two months ago, I got an email suddenly out of the blue from him. And he said, you know, what have you been doing since 1979? 
So we had a long conversation mm-hmm. and we're back in business. Wow. I think I'm sure everybody's having, they're getting back in touch with people that they haven't seen or heard from in many years. And I find that really interesting. Mm. Yeah, wow. very encouraging to see what, uh, like there's, yeah, so many possibilities if you have that creative courage during these times to, to reach out and um, yeah, there's a, a lot of grace and reconciliation things that can happen uh, in times of suffering. So there's, there's hope if we live on that supernatural outlook. You know, there's one more thing if I can ask for your prayers. This, this, this is, this project is two days old, but I've had in the back of my mind, so many people saying to me, my children have no interest in religion, my grandchildren, woe is me, that kind of thing. And the other day I was talking to a young 17 year old who taught me in a saying I had never heard. He said, only dead fish go with the flow. Now, this is someone with a lot of personality, a lot of punch, and who's very open to exploring spirituality. And so he, by saying that, he was saying that he, when his friends say to him, uh, we have nothing to do with religion, he says, you don't know anything about religion. He challenges them. So thinking about that, uh, I've been, these past two days, coming up with ideas for an eventual meditation or talk basically aimed at young people saying to them, be rebels, you know, don't, who wants to be a dead fish? Don't go with the flow. You don't have to. And if, if you're there in your high school class or your college, university class, and your professor is mocking the church, as all too happen, often happens, and your friends are mocking the church. Don't just turn over and play dead. I mean, rebel. And I'm going to remind them that back in back in the the age of Aquarius, you know, the 19, late 60s and early 70s, one of the many bumper bumper stickers was question authority. Because back then that was the zeitgeist, that was the in the air. Well, we can turn that around and say to these students, question authority. Mm-hmm. Question what your professor is saying, where he's criticizing the church. Forget it. And then what I what I'm hoping to do is then come up with different basic, my basic message will be: forget about Galileo, forget about the Crusades, forget about individual human beings, we, we are following God made man. Focus on Jesus, on getting to know him and read, because you don't know anything. What I'm going to end up saying to the young ones, you don't know anything. Read the, fa- read the fathers of the church, you haven't even heard of them. You know, I could go on and on, but this is, this is a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Stay tuned. I like that. Thank you pray for that. Yeah. Um, well, we seem to be, I think we're coming to the end of our time with you, which is, uh, we could easily go another hour, Father Fred. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't do that to you. <laughs> um, it's too, much, too much fun. Yeah, it's certainly too much fun. But we'd certainly like to give you the last word. Well, I'm going to pray a lot for the fruits of this conversation. I've learned a lot just from listening to the two of you. I'm going to pray that, uh, pray for the, the moms and the dads and their and your children, because we, we do have a civilization waiting for us to create with creative courage. And so each one of us is, especially during this year of St. Joseph, we call upon St. Joseph to, to guide us, to inspire us, to give us that courage to set out along new paths and to to make it happen, really, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen.